All right, welcome everyone back for our resident boot camp, uh, session three. And this is a pretty cool session. Uh, the topic is skills for the radiology resident. So these are sort of non-interpretive topics that we think are really useful just for like daily practice as a radiologist. So I'm gonna start us off and we're gonna talk about sensitivity and specificity. And I actually love talking about this topic because everyone doesn't want to hear about it, right? They either say, oh, I have a doctorate. I obviously already understand this. Or I've never gotten it, and you know I'm doing OK, so what's the big deal? Or it's boring regardless. So I actually think it's pretty interesting. So I'm going to show you two cases. We're actually going to go through three pitfalls and just to sort of engage you to see if you can figure it out, if you happen to avoid all three pitfalls in your hand, head, you'll be rewarded wondrously. All right, so here we go. Let's see if you got this down and makes sense to you, all right? We have a non-chess case here, but we'll just roll with it. Let's say that you're doing an ED shift after an amazing chest rotation, and you see that you have a fracture. So here, an obvious scaphoid fracture. So you dutifully call the ED and say, there's a fracture. And your person said, hmm, OK. So just curious, what, what is the sensitivity of x-ray for scaphoid fractures, by the way? And you're like, oh, boy, oh, my gosh, I don't know. Uh, oh, 75%, of course I knew that. Yes, 75%. And he says, hmm, well, I'm terrified over the orthopod. Don't really want to call. 75 doesn't sound so great. Maybe we need an MRI. You're like, look, man, it's clearly broken. Why do we need an MRI? And he said, you said you were 75% sure. I think we needed the answer. So there's your setup. What are we going to do? Do you agree? Going to protocol that MRI? Do you say, I don't think that's right, but I don't know why. I know why it's wrong, and I'm going to tell you. <laughs> or do you have no idea what's going on? Ever have an answer? Do we have a thought? Anybody want to yell an answer out? C. Ooh, we got some C's and we know why. That's bold. I like it. <laughs> All right. So let's see if we can get an answer here. Two ways. One, we talked about sensitivity. What is that? And then two, what is he really trying to ask us? Okay. So here's the secret if this has never been sorted in your brain clearly. Sensitivity and specificity are terms that only apply when you already know if they have the disease or not. Okay? So if you're going to say a sentence, this is how I keep it clear in my brain, the sentence is to say, in someone who is known already to have a disease or not, etc. You might say, that sounds silly. Why do I need a test characteristic that applies when I already know the answer? And I totally agree. This is what's used in controlled settings where we have gold standards and we know already, like research. Okay. So to get such a number, you get 100 people, let's say, who you know have disease, which means you need to have some way to know that, a gold standard. Okay. Then we're measuring this on an imperfect test, in this case an x-ray. Does it still work? So if it finds it in most people, then it's 75% sensitive. So again, this is only in people where we already know the answer. We cannot apply sensitivity directly to an unknown patient presenting. Okay. So sensitivity is the ability to pick up disease that is there. And if it is not sensitive, it turns out to be normal too much. That's the problem. All right, so specificity is its mirror. We take 100 people proven to not have disease already, and then we say, how often is it negative? So for example, most people, then it's 97% specific. Okay? So again, this is only when we already know for sure they don't have the disease. So it's really just a statistic of a, normal, of a test being normal in normal people. It's not very interesting. And if it lacks this, then the problem is it's positive too much, inaccurate. So because it was sort of talking about false positives, you might think, aha, this whole scenario, that orthopod thing, 
was about specificity, but not quite. Okay? What we're really asking is we have a test, an x-ray, and we want to know if it is real or fake. Right? And an unknown patient, unknown disease status. So again, the sentence is, in a person where we don't know if they have disease or not, we have a positive test. So does that mean they actually have the disease? Question mark. So how would we figure that out? What, what are the two ways we have a positive test? It's real because we can pick it up. And also, what is the chance of actually having the disease? Right? If it never happens, we're not going to have very many real positives. And the fake positive is the chance that it incorrectly shows up on a test. It's related to specificity. And again, how much normal is out there in the world? You know, usually a lot. So this term is predictive values. That's what we're talking about. These say how a test does in patients where we don't know the answer yet. So positive predictive value is in someone where we don't know if they actually for real have the disease. A positive test confers what chance of having that disease. And then the negative is the opposite. When we don't know if they have disease or not, a negative test confers the chance of having no disease, question mark. That's a predictive value, okay? Now you might sound, aha, <laughs> these are what we should be using in real life. And that is totally correct, okay? This is how tests perform in the real world. So we're going to wrap up that orthopod case. When it said, you seem 75% sure, maybe we should get an MRI. You say, oh, I get it. <laughs> You're asking me the chances that radiograph confers an actual real fracture. Positive predictive value. It's super high here, 98%. Don't you worry. And then off he goes to call the orthopod. No MRI. All right. Great. So. Sensitivity specificity, when we know already the disease, predictive values when we don't. Okay? And our pitfalls here was thinking about sensitivity and specificity when we care about predictive values. And then two, we fell in this trap of using words like certainty or a sister term, rates, which don't really mean. It's just ambiguous what those mean. So that's a pitfall in this. We use specific language. All right, case two. Let's see how you do in your head with this one. We have 100 cases of a brand new disease across the entire planet, a very expensive cure. No, not the cure for hep C, which is $1,000 a day. Not the most expensive gene therapy that exists. To be cured from this disease, we have to buy you an incredibly expensive car. <laughs> so this is very expensive. We don't want to do this for everybody. So we need to get the diagnoses here. And let's say in this magical disease, a young radiology researcher came to the, the rescue. They found out that in this weird disease, it causes high density in the CSF. That's not blood, that's this disease, okay? So we found a test. And then this young researcher got some colleagues and published the first paper on these 100 cases. He pulled everybody in the world and most had high density, all right, okay? He then found 100 people, so we could have some controls, some normal folks, and most did not have high density. One person who just by random chance had a car accident or something and had a bleed there a while back. Okay, so the sensitivity and specificity, when we know the answer, we had long-term follow-up, we know the answer for sure, was great. So in this paper, he said, this test has high predictive values too. Um, not only sensitivity specificity, but high predictive values. That means it works in the real world, so we should use it. Let's test everyone. All right, and how do you get those numbers, he or she? Well, we take our study population, and they said, who has the positive test? Well, it looks like most of them have the disease. Okay, good predictive value. Who is normal? Looks like most of them are normal folks. So that means negative predictive value is great. Okay? So great test. So what should we do now? I just set you up. Do we <laughs> plan to buy a bunch of cars for a bunch of people? Like this one, look, green stripes, fancy. 
Do we say, hmm, maybe the study is not totally right. Let's do a repeat, but perhaps we should start thinking about it. You can actually buy Porsche stock now. It just IPO'd. You used to have to buy Volkswagen. How interesting. Or three, decide this test is totally useless and throw it away. What's the right answer? And the answer, completely useless test. Okay. But why? So predictive values take into account, yes, how well it performs, but also the likelihood of disease. Okay. So what is the actual likelihood of having this tiny, rare disease? We have 100 people out of a very big planet, right? So that means one out of 80 million actually have it. So if we could actually scan the whole planet, that would be expensive. <laughs> Let's say we do a head CT on the whole planet, 8 billion people. We would get almost everyone with our disease, and we would get what? 80 million normal people who have an abnormal head CT. Because even a tiny percent, if you applied to everyone, that's a lot of false positives. So if you say, what happens when you have a positive test? Fast, fast chance is you're normal, or at least you don't have this disease, you have something else. Right? So our predictive value for this rare disease is basically zero, total garbage, does not help you, because it's like a lightning strike to have this disease, it's so rare. Okay. So what was the error? Not taking into account likelihood. And the likelihood that they were using was what? The likelihood in the research study, which was a case control, 100 of each. This study has tons of people with disease. That was the problem. Okay. <clears throat> so you might say, oh, researchers, they, they're all better trained. They would never do that. Here's a paper on an infection. It talks about the positive predictive value, and it totally calculated it wrong on a case control study. <clears throat> what terrible journal was this? The famous New England Journal of Medicine. Now it's an old study because we've gotten a little better, but I have seen this incorrectly put into radiology conferences right up to a couple years ago. So if you are looking at research or doing research, you need to know the prevalence in your cohort versus the population out there you're testing on. And it does highlight how important our field is with the prevalence underlying our disease, right? This is why we want someone more likely to have a PE to get the test. Smokes enough or old enough to get the lung cancer screening or a certain age to get mammographic screening. Okay. So the pitfall here in our last one was forgetting the importance of uh, prevalence and how it varies in research populations or other. So it's time to drive off into the sunset on this topic. We went over three cases, two cases, three pitfalls. And if you want some more information, we actually summarized this in a paper from a while back, but it has radiology examples and goes over this info. So it's pretty uh, concise to re-review re -review it. And that's it, thank you very much.